Good morning, everyone. One, my name is Thomas uh, Feldberg. I'm honored to start the International Insolvency Meeting, which brings together a fantastic number, a significant number of specialists in the field of restructuring. This webinar is the result of a group of in, set up by the International Solvency Institute with specialists from several countries dedicated basically to studying ways to support companies which have been affected by systemic crises, the international experience from several countries, and the United States and Japan. And then what lessons could be used by Brazil? If you wish to hear the translation, you can click the globe on the screen, and there you have three options either to hear the entire seminar in Portuguese, to hear it all in English, or to have no translation. So for those who are bilingual, so those who are bilingual can choose to listen in their language. The questions and the debate should be sent through the Q&A button, which is also on the screen. I have the honor to present on behalf of the International Insolvency Institute, an impressive group of speakers who will discuss ways to support companies which are affected by a systemic, by the systemic crisis, the current pandemic crisis, and international experiences which were utilized in several countries uh, in, uh, in addressing the same uh, the same problems for companies affected by these systemic crises in different regions. The idea is to offer ideas and suggestions and see how they could be applied here in Brazil. If you wish to hear the whole, there is a button with a small globe in, the, in, your, in your screen. And if you wish to hear the whole presentation in English, uh, please press the English button. If you prefer to hear everything in Portuguese, press the Portuguese button, or if you don't want any translation because you'd like to hear the speakers in their native uh, languages, uh, please uh, press the off button and there won't be any translation. Uh, I would, uh, uh, please, if you have any questions or if you want to participate in the discussions, please uh, press the Q&A button and address these questions. Uh, Without uh, any further communications, I guess, I would like to present Don Bernsey. Uh, you will see the, the bios of all the presenters and the participants in this in the program. You just have to press on their names and you will see their bios. So in order to gain time, we will start immediately with the presentations. Uh, and uh, Don Bernsey, uh, please, Please take over. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. I want to thank all of you for participating in this program about how to secure the resources to finance recovery from the fallout of the current pandemic. Uh, the International Insolvency Institute is proud to be a sponsor of this webinar. Triple-I is a not-for-profit organization dedicated to the improvement of insolvency law and practice. It seeks to promote financial recovery and stability around the world and includes leading insolvency practitioners from over 60 countries. Uh, at the outset of the pandemic, Triple-I organized an expert working group to address the financial distress of small, medium, and large businesses caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Our working group recognized that the pandemic had the unusual effect of cutting off many businesses from their sources of revenue due to the lockdowns in various countries. This includes not only large businesses like those in hospitality, um, travel, and natural resources, it also includes smaller businesses like retailers and restaurants and others. And of course, 
with such pervasive financial effects, uh, businesses uh, result in extraordinary hardships for workers and the public at large. Many companies and countries already faced a shortage of financial resources due to the existing over indebtedness in their economies. The financial fragility due to this over indebted, the adverse financial impact of the pandemic. With these special problems in mind, IIIS Working Group has studied a proposal initially put forward by one of our panelists today, Richard Gitlin, a member of the Institute, and global turnaround expert, Jay Alex. The proposal was that national governments should consider establishing emergency restructuring entities or agencies that would identify viable businesses, channel financial resources to them, and also provide them with access to professional advice and assistance in deploying these resources and restructuring their debts to address the financial fallout of the pandemic. The use of such entities is not unprecedented. Countries in the past have had a variety of agencies with similar features. Um, uh, for example, in the United States, there was an agency of that kind created during the Great Depression in the States in 2008, the veal industry. And of course, Japan, in connection with its Great Recession during the 1990s and since that time, has had several agencies precisely for this purpose. Today's program will be divided into two segments. During the first part of the program, we will focus on the IIII Working Group and global experience with emergency restructuring entities. Richard Gitlin, one of the most eminent insolvency lawyers in the world, will start off by speaking about the possible role of VREs. Uh, and then Shin Abe, a leading practitioner in Japan, will describe Japan's experience with ERAs both for larger, smaller, and medium-sized businesses. And finally, Guillerme Ferreira from Jive Investments will discuss the benefits and challenges of creating such entities with a focus on Brazil. We will then turn the program over to Tom, and Tom will lead a panel of eminent speakers focusing on how the idea of an ERE might be implemented in Brazil. Now, I will turn things over to Richard Gitlin to lead off our discussion. Uh, thanks, Don. And thank you, Thomas, for so much effort in organizing this program. It's truly an honor to be able to be part of it, to present some ideas that may be helpful to Brazil. As Don said, Jay and I were worried back in April that this virus may cause economic harm that might overwhelm our economy. So we decided to write an article proposing, as Don said, an ERE. So governments could begin the thinking process of what it would mean to organize a special agency, which is extraordinary. And it has political implications, economic implications, and it requires a thought process before it can be done. And we were worried, certainly, if the virus continued to do economic harm a, on a prolonged basis, something like this would very likely be needed. Now, why did we come to this conclusion? First, many companies had overly leveraged themselves post-2008 because interest rate was so low. And it was almost irresponsible for companies not to borrow if they had the ability. In fact, the IMF, as um, Jose understands, issued some papers uh, before the virus 
saying we may need a correction because of indebtedness and maybe excess asset prices. But when the virus hit, governments properly responded with enormous capital into their economies. And they did it to stabilize. It was important emergency capital go in. I was really impressed how the whole world seemed to function to be able to do this, to stabilize business, to help individuals. Much of this capital went in the form of loans. Loans to businesses, small, medium, and large. So if we were overly indebted before the crisis, many companies just exasperated that with the capital that came in to respond to the crisis. Secondly, this economic crisis disrupted business. It disrupted the supply chain. It disrupted the sources of revenue so that many companies needed to restructure their business as well as their debt. Included if an enormous amount of capital was gonna be required again, some governments could do it, others would find other sources of capital to do this and would have to, development banks or otherwise. That capital had to go in a different way. That capital had to go from stabilization to growth, to creating jobs and growth. And not just to re put the economy back where it was, because this world is changing so fast competitively. It was to look at the economy and then putting capital in, in this massive basis, reposition the economy for the future. So what would be required then would be a massive program of looking over businesses deciding which ones were viable, which ones were not. Those not viable except for certain social purposes would likely be liquidated. Putting capital into non-viable companies, some people call them zombie companies, will do very little to help the economy in the future. Would have very little to create jobs. So you need to focus on viable companies. But many of the viable companies will fall into the category I just mentioned, still with overly indebtedness and a, and a business model that needs to be restructured based on the effects of the virus. So how do you go about determining which companies are viable, which are not, how to put the capital in, how to do it in a responsible way? And Jay and I had had experience in this. Um, Jay was part of the auto task force uh, uh, strategy team fixing the auto industry and, and quite a remarkable individual. And, and in that case, the government did set up a task force and treasury run by restructuring professionals, but with government policies instructed fix our auto industry. And of course, they put the capital in from the government. It was the only source of massive capital for these companies. And then they ran it through the bankruptcy court in order to have it binding on, on the various parties. Um, I had the good fortune of working with the IMF in Asia and, and working with Japan in some of the things Shin will talk about, where we learned many lessons how you should do this and how you should not do this as you're putting together this type of organization. So what lessons did we learn? If there's going to be an extraordinary restructuring entity put together by the government and often ported, funded government, financial institutions, development banks, whatever, what lessons, what lessons did we learn? First, as I said, the government sets the economic policies, hopefully with a view to the future, not the past. But 
probably what's most important is that, that it be run by restructuring professionals who are independent, who can make independent decisions on viability, not viability, who can make decisions on how the capital should be put in. Probably the most important lesson we learned. Secondly, it must have a sunset law. If you create a massive entity with capital to invest, the people who run it will have a tendency to want to keep it forever, particularly if it's in the government. Every country is like that. So it's very important you set so much time for the investment and so much time to put that in investments that you create into the market. This is not designed to take over the economy. It's designed to solve a crisis. Third, these have to be done quickly. And often there are a number of regulations that have to be satisfied in order to restructure. And we found a regulatory czar from the government who could cut through the different agencies of regulations to help expedite the restructuring was critical. Fourth, in every country we have tax implications of a restructuring. Uh, for this crisis, we recommend there be relief from tax provisions that could impede taking a viable company and putting it back to create jobs and growth. Fifth, although Brazil's banks are stronger and most banks are stronger than they were certainly in 2008, it's possible that this, this massive program can begin to tax their capital again. And in that event, the government has to think about how to give some relief to the banks in order for them to participate in a commercial restructuring so that the company does have a platform for growth. Uh, sixth, we learned in Japan, as Shinabe will describe to you, Different solutions are required for different size companies, large, medium, and small. And in so many countries like Brazil, so much of the economy is in the small category that a specially designed system is critical. Uh, seventh, capital should be put in in a way so it can be recovered, put in in a commercial way so that if the program is successful, the capital can have a return on the capital. Lastly, which I, I stated earlier, those countries which do this well and do this with a view to the future will be the most successful countries in the future. So a vision of where you wanna be must be integrated into the economic policies that the government provides to the entity. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Richard. Uh, now let's turn things over to Shin so he can describe to us the Japan experience. And I think Shin also has some slides to share with us. Sure, thank you. Oh, thank you for the introduction. It is an honor to make the presentation regarding our Japanese experience, the history and roles of emergency restructuring entities in Japan. I will share my slide. There are four types of EREs in Japan. One, Regional Economic Vitalization Corporation of Japan, we call LEVIC. Two, SME Revitalization Support Councils. Three, the Innovation Network Corporation of Japan, INCJ, and the fourth, Japan Finance Corporation. I will start with Levic. Levic deals with large and medium-sized companies. This is the successor of the entity that was known as IRCJ, the Industrial Revitalization Corporation of Japan. So first, I will give you some history about the IRCJ. IRCJ was established in 2003 by the Japanese government. The purpose of the IRCJ was 
to dispose of non-performing loans of banks and revitalize district's large and medium-sized companies. At that time, Japan was experiencing an economic downtown slowdown due to a major accumulation of non-performing loans in Japan's banking sector, which had been festering since the burst of Japan's bubble era in the early 1990s. The RCJ was established to deal with NPLs and rehabilitate the big corporation, which was the pillar of Japan's economy. Under the relevant statute, IRCJ was established with a five-year period to complete its mandate, Sunset Law, Richard has just mentioned. But it completed its mission one year earlier, terminating in 2007 after revitalizing 41 distressed companies. The mechanism of IRCJ is very similar to that of REVIC. So please see the next slide. Levic is also a government-backed company. Similar to IRCJ, half of its funding is from the Japanese government, with a remainder of funding coming from financial institutions in the uh, private sector. Although it was formed by a st special statute as a governmental-backed entity for a specific public policy purpose, it is not a government agency. Therefore, it cannot force banks to refer its district borrowers to ask for REVIX assistance. This means that even if there is a public pressure to rescue a particular company, REVIX cannot swoop in and force its process on the district company. Instead, it must wait until the digital company decides to seek Revix assistance. If once asked, Revix assists the district company to draw up the restructuring plan and negotiate with its financial creditors. Revix, like IRCJ, can inject capital under the plan to restructure the district company. Revic also supports regional banks to provide funding to support regional companies which borrow money from the banks to rehabilitate. Revic also retains and enters into tie-ups with restructuring professionals. They are deployed to distressed companies or to regional banks which need guidance due to not having sufficient expertise or experience with handling the rehabilitation of distressed borrowers. This chart is to give you an idea of the scale of the company that have received Levix assistance. From this chart, you can see that 30% of cases were companies having annual sales of over 50 million USD, US dollar. The largest group were companies with annual sales of between 10 million USD and 30 million USD. Because Levic focus on regional revitalization, the scale of the companies that it assists is relatively smaller than that of the large companies that was a focus of IRCJ assistance. Now, I will move on to discuss SMC revitalization support councils. As indicated by the name, their focus is small and medium-sized district companies. The councils are located in all of the prefecture in Japan. Prefectures are subdivision of government equivalent to the concept of the state of the United States. This allowed the council to provide consultation to local business in need all across the different regions of Japan. The councils assist distress SMEs to draw up a rehabilitation plan and negotiate with banks to get approval for the plan and borrow new money. 
According to the data, over 47,000 companies have sought advice and support from the councils. From the time that the councils came into existence in 2003 to the end of September last year. A unique feature of the Council is that, as a part of Japan's COVID-19 response measures, they have established a new scheme called COVID-19 Special Restructuring Plan, Rescheduling Plan, under which the SMEs are allowed to delay or freeze repayment of its loan for a one-year period and may borrow new money. As shown by the data on this slide, a large number of SMEs have already sought a COVID-19 special rescheduling plan. Now, I will move on to the INCJ. The INCJ deals with very large blue chip companies. The purpose of this institution is to value up capable big companies. But in reality, it deals with restructuring big companies by injecting capital and or selling companies if the INCJ finds that it cannot direct the company successfully to rehabilitation. You can see from the data on this slide that CJ has injected capital in only 8% of the cases that it has undertaken. However, among the cases in which it did inject capital, the amount of funds injected for restructuring was almost 60% of the INCJ's budget to value up companies. Lastly, I'd like to say a few words about the Japan Finance Corporation, JFC, which is wholly owned by the Japanese government. This institution can lend money to distressed SMEs and a newly introduced loan scheme. The JFC can support a potential borrower to remote rehabilitation plan, to make rehabilitation plan and monitoring the execution of the plan, which is a requirement for the JFC to lend money under this loan scheme. Many SMEs have rushed to the JFC to borrow money in order to try and survive in the current COVID-19 situation. The total amount of loans executed between March and September last year is USD 100 billion. So that has been a brief overview of different ERES in Japan. Starting from the era of the ILCJ, which was established in 2003, when the Japanese economy was suffering from the problem of major NP NPLs and deflation, the Japanese government established these various EREs to promote the recovery of the Japanese economy. Under the COVID-19 situation, the Japanese government seems, seems to have decided that it will use the same EREs entities actively to vitalize distressed companies from blue chip to SMEs in order to recover Japanese economy. So, as Richard Gittin told us, restructuring professionals expect to be working together with the EREs more than ever before very soon. Thank you. This is my Thank you, Shen. I think this is a good example of a comprehensive approach that works in a particular economy. And I think this is a, a good way of focusing on how to design these types of entities. Uh, now let's uh, turn things over to Guillermo so that we can talk about a, a little bit about the Brazilian perspective and the financial perspective. Thank you, Don, and thanks, uh, Thomas and the IIII for this invitation. We see that the effect of COVID-19 uh, on most companies has been a loss of revenues, uh, coupled with unforeseen expenses, restructuring expenses, costs related to health uh, and sanitary protections. 
and also changes to the market and to the demand for their products and services. As a result of that, many companies have burned through their existing cash reserves. They had to defer liabilities such as taxes and rent in order to stay operational, and they had to incur more debt. Uh, as a result, what we have today is that many companies are trying to adapt to a new normal where often revenues and cash generated are lower than before. They have higher debt and so higher debt service than they had before. Their loans and liabilities that were deferred are coming due and they have very little working capital to restart and increase their operations. This puts them in a very frail situation, uh, essentially in the brink of financial disaster because as those liabilities mature, they're not gonna be able to pay for it. SMEs, small and medium enterprises in particular, are at greater risk because they started with less reserves, they are less sophisticated, um, and in case of a restructuring, the restructuring costs are proportionally higher. They also have much less access to credit, and whatever credit they have access to is more expensive, which means that any forbearance doesn't have the same effect of giving them true time to adapt because the debt service is increasing the debt burden and will soon become unsustainable. And they also uh, have less attention from the banks who are overwhelmed by a huge amount of defaults and are focusing the attention of their restructuring teams in the larger debts where they can get more recovery for our spend in the effort of trying to restructure and find a solution for their clients. This is true for a lot of companies that were perfectly good before COVID-19 hit. They were viable companies that produced good services, good products that the market wanted. They were financially sound, they were well managed, and suddenly they are in financial distress. Uh, as Don uh, said before, we need to find a way to keep those companies afloat. And we want them to, to continue to operate and to produce services, to generate employment, to pay taxes, and to be functioning members of the business community. But their balance sheets are stretched and they have no working capital. So how can we save those companies? In order for these companies to continue, I see that we need to their existing loans and liabilities. We can do that by giving them more time, but as I said, in the cases of SMEs, that's not enough because the high interest rates mean that the debt service will not be serviceable while we're trying to find more revenues and to resolve the problem. We can give them a haircut, which would uh, probably resolve the problem. And in some situations, we could even convert some of the debt into equity. These companies also need new money for working capital and for restructuring and adaptation costs to the new reality that they're operating in because of COVID. If we can get them those two things, we can successfully keep them from going under and maintain them as functioning companies producing wealth in our societies. So why does this not happen? Or why does it not happen at the scale that it needs to happen? When we're looking for um, answers in Brazil, we have to understand that the banks were very uh, important in the beginning uh, of COVID in providing forbearance to the companies for their clients. Almost all the big banks gave uh, extended loan um, uh, payment times to all their clients without having to discuss specific terms. Um, and they also kept rates relatively frozen as opposed to do what they normally do in a restructuring, which is increase rates because of the increases. So extensions and restructurings that keep principle protected and usually don't produce rates are something that the Brazilian banks do. However, they do not often provide a haircut on existing loans. It can be something related to culture. You know, I don't want to uh, show that this is an option and that this guy can remain a client after having uh, pay, uh, agreed to pay less than what was originally owned. It can be something related to moral hazard. I don't want his neighbor to find out that I did this to him and uh, allow him to, to come here and renegotiate his loan as well. But it's just something not done. Also, banks do not do that to equity conversions, especially for small companies because of successive liabilities and reputational risk. And very unlikely will banks provide new capital to companies that are already in default. Uh, there is the obviously high perceived risk. Uh, there is the feeling that they may be throwing good money after bad money. 
but there's also capital and provision requirements from the central bank, which make those new loans very inefficient and expensive from the bank's perspective. So not just that it's risky and it looks uh, complicated if it goes under in order to defend it to your uh, credit committee, but it's also very, very expensive and inefficient for the banks. So how can we solve this? How can we break this logjam? Well, there are many solutions, but here at Jive, we developed one as part of our business model. What we do is we will buy loans from the banks at a discount. And it might sound uh, strange that the banks are willing to sell the same loans that they were not willing to restructure at a discount. But when you're selling, you're getting the money up front and not a promise to get some amount of money in the future that's less than what you were owed. So it's less hard for them to, to agree to that. Also, the banks know that they have too many loans to restructure and selling is part of how they manage their distressed loan book. There's also a tax advantage because in Brazil, after you sell the loan, you can immediately recognize the loss. Whereas if you have a provision, there is uh, an extended period of time before you can take that as an expense for tax purposes and for income tax calculations. Um, also, because we have that discount now, we have some value that we can share with the borrower, meaning that there is now the possibility that we can restructure the loan, not just giving them more time, but also a significant haircut to make it fit on their new capital structure. And because we're not in the business of making loans and of providing financial services, we're in the business of investing in distressed loans and trying to restructure them, we can focus 100% of our energy into this um, and we can provide more flexibility to the borrower than the bank can. We can often accept payment in kind, We'll take assets, we'll take real estate, we'll take artwork, we'll take cattle, we'll take grain, anything of value really, we can actually take and monetize it later. In some uh, cases, we will even convert uh, that debt into equity. Uh, and because we're a fund, we're not a bank, we're not subject to capital reserves and provision requirements that the banks are, so we do not have that inefficient. Another thing that we do once we become creditors is we'll provide a level of assistance to the borrower in trying to help them restructure. It's not an interim management, not even consulting, but we'll try to introduce them to business partners that they can help them increase their operations. We'll help them find buyers for non-core assets. Maybe they have a plant that's no longer useful. They have um, uh, a certain machinery that's no longer useful because they're not in that line of business anymore. We'll try to help them find someone who'll buy that. Also, we can help them by buying certain types of assets directly. Uh, we buy legal claims that they might have against their clients for unpaid amounts that they might have against the government for taxes that were charged incorrectly. We'll buy real estate that is uh, fraught with imperfections, that has, has title problems, that has environmental problems, and we can help them monetize those hard to liquidate assets right away so that they can be left. And finally, we can also work both with the bank and with the borrower to structure the transactions in a way that everybody feels that if things get better, they will capture some of that upside. So if the bank sells to us and the economy picks up and that borrower is now able to repay that amount in full, we'll share some of that upside with the bank. And that makes the whole thing easier to have. At the same time, if the borrower, um, if we give them a discount and they have a much better prospect than they had when we agreed to that discount, sometimes we'll have an equity quick kicker or another way to capture some of the value that was created by that company so that we can all share in their success. And we can provide new capital. So once the haircut has improved the capital structure and we can go out and buy loans from all the banks that are uh, creditors of this company, we can look at this newly restructured balance sheet and see if new money can be uh, provided uh, safely. Um, we'd like to say that it's a negative interest rate because the borrower starts with a debt of 100, we restructure it to 30 and we loan them another 10 and now they only own 40, so essentially they had a 60 uh, cents on the dollar discount uh, and they had 10 in new money to restructure their operations. It's faster, uh, it's cheaper than bankruptcy, it's cheaper than uh, a DIP loan, uh, which requires um, a lot of uh, court supervision and the creditor approval, and it doesn't come with the stigma of a bankruptcy fine. So if you can find a solution like that, we're much more likely to preserve value of the company and allow them to continue. Now, in order for this, uh, to be helpful in any meaningful way, we need to have scale. So we need to be able to deal with thousands and thousands of loans. Uh, yesterday, I checked the Serasa, which is the credit bureau site, and there are 6 million SMEs in Brazil that have at least one bill or loan overdue. 
So we need to do this in very large numbers in order to be um, to make a dent on the problem that we're dealing with. And because we're dealing with small tickets, we also need to be efficient. We need to do this with technology, with data and automation. So the paradox is that the pandemic helped drive technology that has reduced the costs and the time it takes to restructure an SME loan. Uh, automated document processing, we have less formalities that we're allowed because we can do now electronic documents, electronic deeds and real estate. Uh, all the data is available online so we can get a lot more information on that debtor, on that debtor um, by ourselves. Uh, and so we can effectively restructure thousands and thousands of loans every year and actually use proprietary and private capital to help uh, some of those companies come back and stay in the market. It's 100% market-based. Uh, as I said, it's proprietary services, it's proprietary and, and, and uh, private capital. We run, raise funds in the market. There's no public money. There are no tax breaks, no government support. We do have the IFC as an important investor. We're very proud to say that, uh, but they're invested pari passu with our, with our uh, private investors and uh, we look forward to provide them the same levels of returns, which means that because we're dealing with private capital, um, we have some limitations, right? We're looking for high levels of return to be commensurate with the risk that we're taking and the time that the money is locked up for our clients. So sometimes we can't find a clearing price with the banks um, or a sale is not an option because the bank cannot bear a loss at that moment uh, to um, if they sell those loans. And if they uh, sell, they also feel many times that do not, they do not have the upside on recovery. So there are a few ways that we could do more uh, by leveraging uh, private capital and private expertise with public money uh, and public support. Uh, whether it is a public fund that's managed by a private party and serviced by a private servicer, or it's a senior junior structure where the public money uh, provides uh, leverage to the private capital at a low cost. Um, there are many ways where we can help make public money more effective and leverage private capital and maintain in interests and incentives aligned so that everyone is, uh, is focused on the same results. The public money can help set the policy objectives and the private expertise and money can help implement those uh, objectives. We can also help the banks uh, with the servicing infrastructure. Uh, often the banks, as I said, are overwhelmed trying to restructure um, too many loans so they can outsource some of their loan restructuring work to private services. Um, and there are some ways that we can improve the system as a whole, and I'm sure some of my colleagues here are going to talk about this. For example, by creating a fast track and a simplified restructuring process for SMEs. They're just too small and they don't have enough value in them to go through a traditional bankruptcy processing procedure. We have something in the law, but it's just not efficient and really not being used um, uh, at any scale. Uh, we need to improve the, the protections for the debtor in possession financing, for, for the new money financing, and there are some new um, improvements in the law, and some of my colleagues are going to talk about this today, uh, but I think we're still short of where we need to be. And we should probably facilitate debt to equity conversion by shielding creditors from liabilities when they convert their credits. So I'm really looking forward to hearing some uh, of the ideas and, the, uh, and of the experience uh, that this incredible panel uh, will put forth, and hopefully we'll come out of uh, today with some great ideas uh, and policy initiatives to help um, help with this incredible challenge that we have in restructuring and helping good SMEs stay in the market and continue producing wealth and generating jobs for our economy. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. And that's just a great illustration of how the distressed debt markets have developed in the last 20 or 25 years to the point where they can really make a huge contribution alongside of government on these issues. I'm gonna turn things over to Tom now and we'll move to the more Brazil focused, even more Brazil focused part of the panel. Thank you, Don. Uh, I will now start the Portuguese language uh, panel. You know, I think it would be better if we all speak Portuguese now. Thank you very much for the great presentations. We have seen the experience from the United States, the lessons learned that Richard Gitlin has given us of the 10 necessary points for these policies, for the recovery of the the reorganization of the companies, the Japanese experience, was it, which is extremely valuable. It's interesting that from the 41,000 cases, 
these is a very small percentage which actually received the resources and sometimes it was only technical assistance which obviously is a very important uh, aspect i would now like to invite sergio guzman to start our debate uh, for this panel talking about his experience and the possibilities for the, the development banks offer Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank, first of all, Thomas and Felsberg Advogados for the invitation which was made together with Ambassador Sergio Amaral. It's an honor to participate in this event and for us together to be able to think about how to uh, recover the economy. And I'd also like to greet the fellow panelists and all who are with us in this uh, meeting this morning here in Brazil. I'm currently the president of the Minas Gerais Development Bank and also the Brazilian Association of Development. Uh, our bank is a organization which has its history linked with the development of the economy in Minas Gerais and all neighboring states. And ABD is an association which brings together 31 financial institutions for the development, including public, commercial development banks, promotion agencies, credit cooperatives, SIBRAI, and FINEP. And it is present in all of Brazil without any exceptions. I consider that all the member institutions have worked to supply and increase the credit opportunity in this crisis, apart from having a quick interaction with uh, governments and the central bank to be able to think about special programs becoming feasible. The anti-cyclic activities of the development institutions, I believe, is undoubtedly clear. In order to illustrate this, I have some data of Minas Gerais of a BMDG. When we compare the payments of a financial national system from March and November of 2020 regarding the same period in 2019, we've observed a reduction of 2.3% in the total credit directed to companies. Going against this, the BMG grew 127% in the borrows made. So this is just to show how the promotion agencies in Brazil are going forward. Taking a step back in this, we all know that the health measures to contain the pandemic, which have required and still require social distancing and to maintain only essential activities, have fully affected many sectors of the economy and companies of all sizes. Remembering that currently Belo Horizonte, the capital of our state, has its trade basically entirely closed. A research by Sebrae performed in November of 2020 shows us that 82% of the small companies in the state of Minas Gerais were affected by the crisis. The expectation is of a retraction of 3.9% of the GDP of the state in 2020, with a retraction of 4.3% of the national GDP. From the perspective of financial institutions, therefore, we have seen a scenario of uncertainty in terms of the capacity of the clients to stay without default of contracted agreements, as well as the demand for new credit, especially cash flow, has increased in order to be able to face the problems of the activities which have been stopped, as mentioned by Guilherme. In this scenario, I would like to mention the main aspects by the central bank to expand the availability of capital and to increase liquidity in institutions. Some examples which are more relevant are, first of all, the reduction of the mandatory uh, restrictions of savings, the second, the, the conservation of a principal capital, the third, to no longer have the increase in prevention uh, provisions in a term of up to six months, and fourth, to improve the conditions in order to raise funds in the market through the deposits at a term with special warranties, also called DPGE. It's interesting to highlight that these measures were also seen by the central bank prohibiting the distribution of profit and to increase the uh, salaries of the directors and the administrators. This was a very expensial to not have the additional provisions of the better conditions in order to be able to raise funds through DPG, which in 2020 represented over 600 million reais. 
These measures helped us to assist companies that were in turn that of standstill, a standstill for up to six months for the municipalities in Minas Gerais. These periods were of up to four months with a possibility of extending the total period of the operations for the same amount of time. So this was very relevant during the pandemic. From the new credit perspective, the funds which are managed by federal financial institutions were very relevant in order to make it feasible to have credit at an advantageous conditions for companies, but that did not represent a threat to the sustainability and the stability of those institutions. FGPA, which is managed by BNDES, was made available to guarantee up to 30% of the operations with small and medium-sized enterprises, and the average interest rate practiced in the portfolio at each institution could not be greater than 1% a month. At least 92 billion were funded using the FGBA guarantees, and 114,000 companies were benefited. 40 financial agents used the fund and as a guarantee in the operations, and of those 14 institutions associated to ABDE. FGO, which is managed by Banco do Brasil, was used for Pronampi, a special program for small and medium-sized enterprises, and the coverage is up to 85%. The maximum interest rates of this program was Silic plus 1.25 a year. It had a high demand over 500, nearly 500,000 companies were benefited. 19 financial institutions acted as a financial agent of FGO PRONAMP, and of those, 12 are associated to ABD, and together they represent 79% of the values contracted. Apart from the FGPA and FGO already mentioned, there's already have a traditional FG and the FUMPI, which is managed by SEBRAE. These guarantee funds were those pillars of the anti-cyclic aspects of the institutions for development. In the case of BDMG, to give you a practical example, in the five prior years, we had approximately 1.37% of the values contracted by SMEs before it was totally protected by the guaranteeing funds. In 2020, this amount increased to 38.9%. The government of Minas Gerais, recognizing the importance of having credit available for the companies in Minas Gerais, has also created a Fundo Invest Garantidor, in other words, with the support of a state government and, and has contributed 70 million reais to this fund. Resources which can be asked as a second level guarantee if the other funds used by BMDAG have a stop loss uh, levels reached. BADMG as an in important instrument, uh, institute instrument, sorry, for the Minas Gerais companies for the inclusive and sustainable grow, growth has been highlighted. BDMG in the month of May in 2020 received 100 million increase in capital by the shareholder, the government of Minas Gerais, in order to strengthen the bank and increase the support to the operations of the institution. Therefore, the relevant activity of BDMG and the emergency programs was only possible because the institution has a very modern digital platform which was created in 2012, which makes it feasible to automate credit analysis, release, guaranteeing speed and safety, especially for the SMEs. Digitalization of the financial institutions, which is something used more and more often, it's including artificial intelligence, is very promising. The Open Bank, which the last uh, phase is for the 15th of December of 21, there's a big expectation to be able to increase the competitiveness in the national financial system with a supply of products and rates which are more and more personalized. Another tool which might contribute in a significant manner to fund the regrowth of SMEs are the assisted credit programs, which are a result of a partnership of SEBRAE with development institutions with, such as BDMG. Through this partnership, SEBRAE offers free of charge to the clients a set series of management trainings, technical information, good practices, analysts, uh, and consulting services provided by SEBRAE for the SMEs to manage their, to improve their management and their market positions. This program is already the biggest training program of BDMG, and it will benefit in our first stage over 3,500 companies. 
So now going on to the recovery agenda growth, which might also be known in the Build Back Better. Since 2019, BDMG has its strategic planning for the sustainable development. In line with the Agenda 2030 of the UN, which establishes the 17 sustainable development goals. This positioning was crucial for the bank to expand the capacity to receive money from multilateral agencies and development agencies. And in 2020 was a record year, not only for the payments made, but also the capital increases of over 2.3 billion reais. These partnerships were affirmed with the Inter-American Development Bank, the French Agency for Development, the European Investment Bank, CAF, the Latin American Development Bank, FOMPATA, the Plata Development Fund for Development, amongst others. And in December 2020, BDMG has affected its first issuance in the history of sustainable bonds, which was performed by a Brazilian public bank. Well, actually, by any bank. The operation took place in the New York Stock Exchange with $50 million value and has the objective of making it feasible to fund projects with an environmental focus and a social focus at the same time. This uh, inter-American Development Bank acquired the totality of these bonds in its first issuance. This shows that the projects which congregate the economic recovery and sustainable development have a greater potential to attract foreign investments and national investments. In order to leverage these projects, there are some proposals which are very interesting which are being seen in the Brazilian Congress. I'd like to mention, for example, ELS 133 of 2018, which creates the credit letters for development to be issued by the development banks which are very similar to LCA and LCI, PL23 of 2020, which provides incentives to issue debentures for sustainable developments, and 1588, which in general terms articulates the financial institutions for promotion in order to make it feasible to have credit in good conditions for the SMEs. Coming to credit recovery, which is not least important, but those are the initiatives to make it more efficient to have credit recoveries. The second half of 2020, BDMG launched a campaign to renegotiate, especially credits which are already in court proceedings of difficult recovery. Despite the profile of those credits be of default prior to the pandemic, the availability of attractive conditions has allowed us to formalize over 230 agreements for a cash payment for 2021. We have some projects which are already ongoing in order to enhance the process for the payments. The idea is to approach customers with difficulties in a quicker and more efficient manner, offering as soon as possible association uh, possibilities for renegotiation. We also see the sales of the credit portfolio of difficult recovery as companies that are specialized in this to generate results for a company, but also to release technological resources and human resources from making these collections. This sell to public banks needs more legal framework certainty as these are operations which are many times questioned by the state audit courts. It's necessary to see that the discounts given in these operations, the haircut that are done for credits that are over 10, 15 years and the price obtained through a public tender as an auction. Therefore, BDMG has been interacting with the state uh, attorney and the prosecutor's office to see what is being done in other public banks. We also have the expectation that the reform of a bankruptcy law will be able to make it quicker for the process of the sales of assets when that's the case and to approve the restructuring plans. I think this is very positive alterations, which we're looking at this and the discounts which are made to pay the tax debts, which allow the creditors to present a recovery plan when the debtor doesn't do this or does this in a way which doesn't meet the creditors. I think we are still in the phase to analyze the impacts of the law in the bank's operations. So coming to an end, I assess that based on the business models which are established on high performance and in line with the international development, sustainable development agendas, BDMG and the Brazilian institutions for the promotion and to, to finance development can have presented an effective result to the health and economic crisis for 2021. We are hopeful of the vaccine and the deceleration of the pandemic. Despite this, 
We will have a year of many challenges. We will continue to pay attention to the needs of our customers, making it feasible to have investment impacts in line with the international development agendas. In a partnership with all other ABD partners and with a financial system, we need to work together to build a path for the future, a, a path for growth in the national development agenda with a broad front which can think about the necessary changes and the direction to which we want to go, sometimes making it clear purposes for social economic development supported in pillars of sustainability, digitalization, respecting the environment and climate change, and preparing Brazil for the economy of the future. Mr. Moderator, this is it. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm available for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the broad of the presentation you have given us and aspects which are so important for today's debate. I'd now like to invite uh, Bruno Laskowski of the BNDS to tell us a little bit about the BNDS's activities and the perspectives for the BNDS. Good morning, everyone. Thomas, uh, thank you very much for organizing this conference, which is so important. And for this institute, it's a pleasure to be here with you and to share this time with everyone. I'd like to speak a special greeting to Joaquin Levy. Uh, this is Sergio also, and a, a, a friend of many initiatives. Let me just give you some context and try to do this in a very brief manner. The bank, it was very active in the crisis scenario, just to give you an idea of numbers for everyone. We, from direct monies, and the restructuring products, the bank has provided 200 million reais to see, look at the economy in a more critical moment. Uh, I'd say that we have done a series of initiatives which we have anticipated this moment and that we thought were going to happen. I'll give you some examples. And in the pandemic, we restructured, we organized ourselves to do these moments and to support this. So, in the big innovations which were done, I think it's important to mention, Sergio has just told us about this, about uh, transformation. And this is something which is related to the credit insurance. So, in reality, the FGI, the Investment Guaranteeing Fund, which actually guarantees a credit, it's a credit insurance in Brazil is uh, we're still starting. This fund exists, it's there. This is something that we have on assets under management of uh, close to 4 billion, just for you to have an idea. We have injected in the economy, especially for SMEs, something close to 94 million. So we were able in reality with the money from the treasure, from the treasury structured through BNDES, shaped with the risk of BNDS something close to 20 billion. There was an injection of resources of 20 billion, and those 20 billion were leveraged in order to generate and to uh, irrigate the economy with over 90. Apart from this initiative, we did a standstill, which was very important already, knowing the critical moment the companies were undergoing. It's important to note that a series of initiatives took place, and I'd like to mention some which are very uh, big landmarks. BNDS uh, had funds of creditary rights, which is an element of transformation. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about this, about the areas in which today I am uh, managing basically BNDS PA, the capital market, and this is an element which is very important because this is in line of the lessons learned, as was mentioned. We got the area of a restructuring and we put it inside of this uh, division, of this uh, directorate, in order to have other alternatives to be able to make it possible 
uh, the quickest way out for those companies that have a contingency or have difficulties or have problems, credit problems caused by an important rupture caused by a more acute moment in the economy. But what we understand that as these are restructuring measures and that with the structures of the capital markets, we could put these companies that are healthy companies and make them healthy again and to reduce the problematic uh, uh, portfolio. It is important to mention that in this or restructuring that we have, the, this area which we are calling credit, digital credit, this is the indirect credit which we're transforming the BNDES and digital, digitalizing the credit relations, especially for SMEs. Just for you to have an idea, our collective efforts, BNDS, the regional banks, and the system as a whole with these measures, with these nearly 200 billion uh, in, in, in uh, capital injected into the economy, our math is that we have impacted over 400,000 companies, close to 10 million jobs which were saved. This is very relevant if we look at any factor, if we look at any element of comparison with a historic uh, series. This action is something which has other implications. So going into the spirit of the lessons learned, in our structure, in our restructuring situation, which is a very classic structure for the restructuring of assets in a bank, we have two divisions. We've divided this into two blocks. One area, which is responsible for the problematic assets, or called as problematic, of a whole 150 million, and another area of the assets that it have as a base, I'd say, more massified, uh, if I could call it like that, with different uh, positions under 150 million. In the second uh, field, let's say, I think this is a process of transformation causing a disruption, we will have a first auction of non-performing loans. Our target here, I want to be careful because there are many details, but uh, we're going to have this first auction. My expectation is that we may hold this until April of this year. We have seen a lot of discussions taking place, a lot of complexity, which is to make this happen. But uh, I'm very sure that in many meetings with the uh, inspection agencies, uh, with a lot of rules, we are being able to overcome these issues. And we're very motivated to have this first auction of the non-performing loans on a base which might bring us the opportunity to do this more often. Just to give you this uh, a dimension, and with this I start to wrap up, we manage today at BNDES something like 40 billion a portfolio of uh, assets that have issues or problematic credits of 40 billion. So yes, as Guilherme Ferreira has mentioned prior to my talk, this is something that we, we, we didn't have it. We have to create, we, we don't have to create a, an, a department for consulting a, a department uh, uh, for this, but we have to establish a, se a series of partnerships with the private initiative, with restructuring firms. We understand that it is not just to inject resources. The role of a development bank is also to inject intelligence, management intelligence, skill building, in order to have these companies transform themselves and this is, can't be done through the public machine, obviously, but obviously we have to have uh, partnerships with the private initiative. And we understand our role, not only as someone who injects resources or restructuring, obviously we have to have, see this happen, but also with strategic objectives to make it feasible to recover the operation of these companies to an extent in which they generate uh, jobs. And just to wrap up, 
this activity which we have established here at BNDS, at BNDS PA in all of our fields, this is very clear for all of us. This is something which is in our strategic vision and strategic vision of a bank with a lot of governance, internal governance, but also governance in the companies. We understand that it is very important to deal with governance and all the issue of ASG. So this governability, this activity is something which is also led by a vision of responsibility, the environmental aspects and governance is something which is very clear that the resource management is linked to improving the management of the companies. This is uh, my, the end. I'm available for any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bruno. In fact, uh, this uh, participation with the, the knowledge of the restructuring process as uh, Bruno mentioned in his presentation, is a crucial element of this process. The issue of recovery, and I think this is also something in line with what Sergio mentioned, it is crucial in this equation. It doesn't suffice, obviously everything is important, but uh, only resources is not enough. They have to be employed if a vision that allows us to reorganize or to recover companies and to generate uh, revenue and, and cash, which is what will allow them to have a better recovery of those credits. Uh, a situation for win-win, because obviously you recover more credit and then that allows a company to survive. This is very, very interesting. Thank you very much. So now, I would like to ask Ariane to please uh, give us her intervention talking about the perspective that the World Bank has regarding these aspects which have been raised. Good morning, everyone. I'd also like to thank uh, the invitation to participate in this debate in this panel. Let me give you a little bit about uh, the context. IFC has created its global investment platform and stress assets investments in 2007. So this is just over a decade. And this is something that started exactly at the timing of a big crisis of 2008-2009. Uh, Our history in Brazil is also just over 10 years. We had our first investment in 2009 in a new company, a startup, where we were founding members, which was recovery. And so all the history of evolution with different uh, uh, controllers, and we exited the company in 2020 because, in fact, we closed the cycle with the company when we look at the market, it's not different to other markets. We today have, uh, since the beginning of this program, $7.7 .7 billion allocated, of which 2.7 are ours and 5 billion from third parties, because we work in a way which is that when we have a role that is to be a catalyst where we give a sign for other in investors to see the opportunities of, invest in of investing with good practices. IFC focuses a lot on the issue of governance, on good uh, social and environmental practices and all the criteria used to assess market conditions. So be this a regulatory aspect, of which is favorable, be it also issues related to good uh, collection practices, and also the history of managers who act in this uh, market. Obviously, who comes first? The regulatory issue is, yes, very important. And in an, invest, in an environment which is favorable to investors, it's also very important. I think Brazil has a very positive uh, history with this. 
where a decade ago you basically had very few players in the market where we started all of our history and in this period we've seen a significant uh, evolution obviously now there's an issue which is a little bit more difficult to see where it's going to go because in the retail market this was a market where we were having independent companies and obviously after the success of recovery everyone went in the line of consolidation and in fact uh, to consolidate this market and other players also bought into this many companies of uh, collection so where where will this go that's a big question mark but now with the issue uh, that Guilherme very well told us of how they operate, what they do, as we understand this as part of our work, to identify those who have a track record, who could be a good partner for IFC. They have this focus of small and medium-sized enterprises, which is something which implements our strategy of also to preserve jobs. But in Brazil, we still have a deficiency. With the creation of a law, it might be that, in fact, we might be able to identify new players and we might create more safety and certainty in the system for us to have this, uh, this market and uh, the stress also, but also the turnarounds and recovery of companies, which is something which is crucial. But this is a very lengthy period. In 2016, when I moved to India, today I'm in Washington, but when I moved to India, the new insolvency law was being implemented. There was a lot of regulatory work in this, and the problem of India was a problem which already was very big at that time. But very urgent to be dealt with. We had the implementation of a new law, which is still uh, ongoing. It is something which is recent, in 25 years. But the fact that this has become a regulatory framework, which is more dealt with in terms of the unsafety of the timing, of the protection of investors. Today, we've already made many investments. We're making new investments now in India with other partners and what we see more and more often, big players coming into the world market. So, so IFC has a role in, to identify and to work with companies to see the good practices, but we also seek a return because we must be sustainable. But one role is a catalyst, and as a catalyst, investors want return. So today, when we see the evolution of this uh, framework and the crisis we have, and lower interest rates, the appeal of those uh, assets increase. Therefore, there's a lot of monitoring which we do in order to recover the debt. So I, I hope this is another step for us to have a new phase of the evolution of a market, of a stressed market in Brazil. We continue to be present now and we continue to look at the Brazilian market very closely, just as we do in other continents. So today we look at a lot of this evolution with COVID. This is a global crisis where, yes, we will have a competition for resources, for international resources, but where liquidity is favorable. I think this is very important timing. That's what I had to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ariane. I think you mentioned something which is very important, but the new law 
which has changed the insolvency law in Brazil, this law has changed the pendulum, I'd say, the balance between creditors and debtors. And I think this has led to excessive litigation and very little efficiency in companies' recoveries, which is, in fact, the best way to recover the credit. So in this pendulum now, I think the burden of the decisions related to default credits goes to the creditors. So the creditors now are the ones that will have the possibility of presenting a plan and will be able to determine this. So we also hope that there may be a cultural evolution in terms of not privileging the small gains in the short run, but yes, privileging the recovery of these companies which might generate the necessary returns for the recovery of a credit. So this is a significant change, and I, f I hope that some of the things that we see which have been shown by the presentation, I think this is something which might be pushed away by the progress in this tax area because those are the hurdles that have been placed for the recovery of companies which don't increase, quite the contrary, they reduce the revenues. We know that insolvent companies usually don't have how to pay. Companies that have been recovered will pay their taxes. So I think the focus of this, uh, this draft bill, this draft law be kept and that this uh, stops creating hurdles to the recovery and regeneration of companies. I would now like to hear Sergio Garrido. Sergio has a specialization in the analysis, which he does of several different legislations of the countries, of the practice of different companies in this uh, area. So I'd like to ask Sergio to give us our comments. Good morning. Thank you very much to the organizers of this event and all of you who are with us today. I'm going to switch to English. Uh, no need to punish you with my Portuguese. Um, and uh, I, I also want to uh, make clear that uh, this, uh, this is an extraordinary um, session with uh, incredible expertise. Uh, and uh, international and also, of course, on the Brazilian side. So from my side, what I can bring here is some comparative analysis, rather some analysis uh, about what is the situation worldwide. And hopefully some of the ideas that are being discussed will be useful for reflection. So it's really interesting that when you look at the 2020, the um, numbers of insolvency cases uh, around the world have actually gone down. And, uh, and there are two main reasons for this. One is uh, the existence of restrictions in many countries, legal restrictions, legal barriers to use insolvency processes. And the other one that I think even more important is the existence of programs that uh, have supported uh, businesses. So this government support has actually kept a lot of businesses alive. So this is, this is uh, actually a situation that is evolving. And the uh, big question right now is, what is the extent of this crisis? And the fact is that we don't know, but uh, that appear every day. And this very week, for instance, there was a very interesting study that shows that 10% um, of enterprises in Europe have less than uh, six months in terms of cash buffers. So in six months, these companies, without any further support, they are actually going to be insolvent. And uh, on top of that, there's also an estimation in, also in Europe about the capital shortfall. The capital shortfall in European businesses is right now estimated at 1 trillion euros. So uh, what this means is that uh, right now, I think that the debate is on the 
transitioning from different models of government support. In this first stage of the crisis, we've seen a lot of support by way of loans and guarantees. And I believe that Brazil is a case in point. And as Richard was explaining before, this support has actually increased the leverage of businesses. So those businesses that were already over leveraged have now a much bigger problem. So what we see is a debate right now on how to transition to solvency support programs. And of course, uh, the first uh, caution here is that uh, an ambitious solvency support program can only be contemplated if uh, the country has fiscal space. So this is going to be a big factor and it's going to be very, it's going to be really decisive in the way that countries are going to tackle the crisis. But taking into account that uh, many countries will have enough fiscal space to uh, have these solvency support programs in place, there are many challenges also. Liquidity support programs have been uh, largely generalized with no discrimination and uh, solvency support programs cannot work that way. Solvency support needs to be directed to those companies that are going to profit from it. And, uh, and especially countries should avoid supporting zombies. Now we have several technical problems here, as you may be aware. First of all is that uh, it is very difficult to determine viability in the context of this crisis. Normally, we analyze viability taking into consideration the projections uh, of uh, future income of businesses. Now, in this context, it is very difficult to project future income. And that's a big challenge. I think it's a technical challenge where specialists are, are, are really working on finding some methodologies on uh, finding viability. Part of the debate is actually that maybe we should focus not so much on determining viability, which is going to be very difficult, but rather in determining non-viability. So if we are able to exclude businesses that are clearly non-viable from solvency support, probably that's all we need to do for now. And uh, bearing in mind that maybe we are, comment we are committing a mistake, but uh, we are committing the le least costly mistake. And uh, I just want to um, finish by considering that uh, there will be a big role, of course, for restructuring and insolvency. And uh, in essence, uh, because of the extent of the crisis, there could be a massive triage of businesses so that some businesses will actually receive solvency support. But there will be other businesses that will need to be restructured in order to receive uh, government support. And this is where I understand that an agency that provides expertise for restructuring and helps coordinating creator action will be extremely useful. And it's also important to distinguish between businesses that will receive uh, support and be restructured outside the courts and those that would need to go through the courts. And uh, I think it's, it's, it's not, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't take a lot of effort to guess that the courts are going to be overwhelmed and uh, there will be massive backlogs. And that really increase the need for out of court solutions. For, and this can be very well supported by special institutions that have the restructuring expertise and can actually support restructuring with funds. Um, Thank you very much. This is all for now. Sure, Thank you very much. I would like to ask our Minister Joaquin Levy to please give us his uh, aspects on consideration on the system which he has been looking at uh, lately. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here with this group discussing a topic which is so important. I wanted to say I was very pleased to see the situation of the uh, presentation of Japan. At the time, I was still at the IMF and I participated in many activities, many missions. And I saw some of those initiatives 
of the debts. The problems that we have with the insolvency in the banks, which this leads me to an observation regarding this crisis that we have of our crisis of uh, 2008. If this crisis, of, oh, this is an aspect where we have an excess credit uh, despite having this, uh, the interest rates of what we have uh, stimulated. This is a situation not only for Brazil, but for other countries also. This is when we have uh, issues of something which is being fragile. Quite the contrary, we have some banks in good conditions there we had some external sh shocks, etc., which are completely autonomous. So the way in which we deal with this might reflect this uh, priority. It is obvious that taking into account the, the size of this uh, shock, it was very important that the monetary authorities had to take actions in order to allow the banks to answer responsibly with a minimum uh, space and and this are some of the measurements which were taken and some of the aspects that we have the issue of the capital and after the all the activities that we have which are preventive which the government take and took and which were very well explained by bruno regarding the programs of the guarantees for investors mediated by the BNDES, which have allowed us to even reach a group of companies that are involved and affected by COVID, which are mostly the SMEs. In this sense, since the beginning we have been involved in this very strong response to the situation. First of all, in the big clients, allowing the credit lines which they had, releasing them at the beginning of the pandemic, a credit expansion which was very significant, which gave these comforts some uh, comfort until the economy started to come back. And then a very active involvement and some of the platforms involved, the digital platforms, was a very important movement with the programs directed to the small and medium enterprises. More specifically, uh, I think something which is very clear of the situation, which is the, the, the what we call maquininhas, which are the the POS machines. So these are small uh, business owners where they have those POS machines for credit cards. So this was a very pioneer project. And as we have a good capillarity, this is something where we can participate, I think, in a very intense manner. And this is something that we have to look at. This is a uh, something that we are looking at. This is with two things that we have to be paying attention to, to see how the central bank will deal with some of the measures that have been taken last year, and also the renegotiation that has been done with this. And this includes the evolution of COVID and that creates more stress in all the sector of services, etc., restaurants, etc. When we look in this direction, I repeat here what Thomas mentioned, I think this new law, something which is very encouraging, and this reduces the cost of this process, both from the issue of the negotiation uh, outside of the courts, the negotiation in order to reduce the debt. And on one side, we have more time for us to be able to make a plan at this, but this is something which allows the creditors to propose a plan. I think this new balance is something which is very important 
even when talking about financing. Uh, this is the financing of a new money and for the protections that this new money has for the finances. So I think we are encouraged how the understanding of these public uh, bodies to continue to look at this all and to see how we are going to uh, bring this normal in 2021 in such a way where this was able to be avoided last year. I think this is a very slow process. This, this is a process that there's the, the standstill period that some of these credits have. And I also think that we have to closely follow these companies and with continued support from the central bank throughout this entire process. I think this is something which will be very important because all of this addresses a point which uh, Jose Garrido just mentioned, which is the issue of fiscal capacity. I think uh, measures were taken, in my opinion, these measures uh, are measures which have saved a lot of money to the government despite the guarantees have been given. But if you protected the companies at a moment in which they were still not at a situation which was extremely fragile. And the last comment is that the law does something very else, which is very important. The new law, the new bankruptcy law brings something else, which is very important, which is to facilitate the return of uh, someone who had a difficulty back into the market. So even if you can't save the company, but the prohibition time for that person to become an entrepreneur again, I think that is something which is reduced. And obviously we want to continue doing this. We want to continue being protecting the creditors, etc. But from this standpoint, for you to allow the entrepreneur to once again do this work, this is very important, especially because what we will see ahead of us once again, it's different from the classic situation for a period of a boom in which there's a type of crisis and the default of the companies. We will continue to see now not only a recovery which depends a little bit on the speed of how this happens, etc., but uh, on, on terms of how quickly vaccination will take place, etc., but many consequences that we have of the acceleration of technological change that COVID brought us. So this means that the flexibility of the companies to close and open, as I mentioned, without uh, too much uh, time, but protecting uh, investors, this is something which becomes more important because when you have a structural change, uh, many people, many businesses will have to acquire this uh, performance. And we know that the speed to reallocate the capital, uh, protecting all those people, this is a speed in how we reallocate the capital. This is something which is crucial for us to keep the growth for us to be able to increase the productivity of the economy and to adapt to the new challenges and to the new possibilities which we will have in a world in which we have uh, the changes taking place and including all the issues of 5G, etc. I think this will create a huge number of new opportunities and will be a true source of growth. It will be a boom in the economy, which we'll be able to see happen. So I think this makes today's conference even more timely. And we, as a bank of over 170 years uh, with all the changes, uh, shocks, transformations, etc., we will continue uh, navigating with our customers and our partners in the public sector in order to be able to drive the growth of the economy using all the opportunities that these new technologies have given us to increase the credit capillarity for the companies. And I think this is something which will be crucial for us to see 
the regrowth of a Brazilian economy, I'd say even in a more democratic manner in terms of access to credit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Levy. Without further ado, I'd like to ask our Ambassador Sergio Maral to wrap up. But before this, I'd just like to say that, that these were so many and such good ideas, such good uh, thoughts presented that I would even like to suggest that we establish a working group to follow the evolution of these topics about Brazil and also obviously to be able to support with suggestions and new ideas. But I would now like to give the floor. I think we've already gone beyond the time, but we have five triple I to Ambassador Sergio Amaral to give us his wrap up. Ambassador, your microphone is not on. Now, can you hear me? Is it working now? Yes, it is. I think as Thomas has mentioned, there are so many ideas and such positive ideas which have been presented this morning that I think it's very difficult for us to uh, uh, summarize them. And I wouldn't even say this is my purpose. I would just like to highlight some topics in order to view the continuity of this conversation, which I also thought were very good and very interesting. So I would like to highlight that this topic and these conversations have triggered a lot of interest, so much so that we had 120 participants uh, registered to participate in this meeting. And with some new participants who were not included in the list of speakers, but that definitely have a very high contribution to give us, such as the directors for Brazil and the Inter-American Development Bank, which has Jean Klein, who's a director in this area, and also Sebrae, when the president is amongst us, Bruno, who is also someone who is very interested in the follow-up of our conversations. And the issue that we have been talking about is the need to have resources of the crisis at the moment in which uh, Gahida very well mentioned to us, the nature of these resources or the nature of this funding, which is moving with more emphasis in recovery. And above all, in the reduction of this to be able to help the companies to return to the market and therefore help to recover the economy. Everyone has highlighted, which is uh, something very important, the differentiation in companies that are feasible, the need to have sunset clauses, and this is very important to have a presentation on the experiences of other countries, such as Japan and the United States. And there's an aspect which I believe is very important and which has been highlighted, which are the national programs which have to take into account the big uh, medium-sized companies and the small and medium-sized enterprises. And that's why it's important to have Sebrae amongst us. I think uh, the, the monetary fund, uh, the IFC, I think it's this is something which is very relevant and I hope that they continue to be present in the discussions which they might have. Levy has brought us a presence uh, which is Levy as a minister, has placed a, a something which is very relevant, which is a text of the new moment of a crisis in which apart from the issues of indebtedness, we will have the challenge of the technological changes. But the issue which we have based on these two ideas is how to implement national programs, not implement because the programs already exist and they are much uh, bigger. Sergio Guzman has very well shown us this, but it's how to add these experiences which can be shown of what the companies and the Brazilian institutions are already doing. And that is how Thomas has told us, this is the International Institute of Insolvency 
which is available to continue with this conversation. So I think this is something that we've seen in broader meetings, which are more directed for specific topics. And I think this is done through a small group of uh, uh, a working group for us to design based on what we have discussed, some of the suggestions, concrete suggestions for its implementation. And I think these are suggestions which can be directed to the public entities, but also to the private entities, which as Guilherme has mentioned, and Jaidi, this is being done with uh, a large performance and a big and important contribution. That's it, uh, Thomas, and thanking you once again, thanking everyone for your presence. And above all, I'm very pleased to see that this effort is bringing results, triggering interest, and that we have many opportunities to work together. Thank you very much, Ambassador. I'd like to once again thank all of you for attending. Uh, Bruno Lapskowski, Joaquin Levy, José Garrido, and all others who have uh, presented to us with a great amount of knowledge and expertise. And I hope that the contribution of the III may be positive, as I believe it was, and that it may also continue if we are able to, in fact, establish a working group to be able to follow these initiatives, which were so well mentioned by the ambassador. So thank you very much to everyone. And please excuse us for having gone beyond our time limit, but I think it was uh, very, very interesting. And I also ask all of you who have asked questions, but unfortunately we will not have time to answer the questions, but we will forward these questions to the people to who they were addressed so that they can respond directly. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you all. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you all. Obrigado. Parabéns, Thomas. Thank you. Obrigado. 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 Thank you, everybody.